Um, I'm Jim Gazard, I'm Director of Continuing Education uh, here at the University of Cambridge Institute of Continuing Education. So let's make a start. Um, so in the UK, it's about 27 degrees Celsius today. It's a beautiful afternoon. We might be a little bit sleepy after lunch. So I wanted to just start with a gentle, non-controversial question. And so we're going to run a poll. It's a yes, no question. So I'm going to force you not to sit on the fence. But I, I wanted you to think about whether higher education in the UK, um, in, in the developed world, do you think it's a, a broken system or not? So could you just complete the poll uh, in the next few seconds, please? Okay, so that is really interesting. So the broader sense is that higher education in the UK is functioning and is effective. It's important to know your audience, so I will proceed on that basis. Thank you for participating. So my, my central aims for the next 20 minutes or so is really to help adults who are learners, who are students, to make informed thoughtful and effective decisions about their learning. Our time is too precious, our money is too precious to make poor decisions. So I want to get you thinking about learning for professional purposes, so-called economic capital, learning for networks, friendships, uh, engagement, social capital, and learning for identity capital, our own sense of worth, and mental health. I think more so now than ever, all forms of learning are so important to make sure that we are employable, that we are engaged, that we are healthy and well. So my role today, I'm gonna to present some ideas to you. Um, in the tradition of Cambridge, I might not actually agree with these ideas, but I'm here to make you think. And certainly you do not need to agree with me. I hope many of you will disagree but I want to get us thinking about learning throughout our lives. And so of course we can't avoid the context that we are now in, this tragic context, this situation of a pandemic we haven't seen for a hundred years previously. But I want to be optimistic, I genuinely feel the future of higher education is optimistic, is bright, and has worth and has value. But I feel that that future has to be more accessible, more diverse, more affordable, more impactful. Uh, and it has to be across our entire lives. And I'm going to suggest that we might need to unlearn, to forget, what we've come to understand as contemporary higher education over the past two, uh, two decades or so. And I'm going to propose that we might want to recall the spirit and the lessons from the radical pioneers of extramural education uh, in the Victorian period in the 1860s, 1870s through to the early 1900s. So it's a question really, do you agree with me or not? that we should go back to our roots to make higher education more effective today. So before I put forward my arguments, my concerns about UK higher education over the past 20 years, I want to acknowledge how successful by, by many measures it has been. In 2002, the then government said they wanted 50% of younger people to go to university. And last year, 17 years later, that ambitious, important, valuable goal has been realised. So in one sense, I would put forward an argument that UK higher education has been phenomenally successful 
in the first two decades of this century. So let, let's look in a very um, crude way about what the recipe for that success has been. The, the undergraduate degree has been so central. Um, a three or four year course of study. Um, it's, it's quite unusual. Why three years? Why four years? It's quite a risk for someone to take to spend that amount of time. But the product of the degree, if I can call it that, has been phenomenal. It has been so successful. And it has been built around a campus-based model. These cathedrals of higher education, amazing facilities, amazing campuses, where students gather and learn as a community. But this success has been around full-time learning, effectively having to stop your life for three years, four years, and learn and commit to that learning. The success has been built around primarily a segmented market of younger students, not exclusively, but primarily, and a brilliant, diverse international audience. And that recipe for success is scaled. Higher education in the UK, in the US, Canada, Australia has grown. It has been successful. But I want to challenge you with another poll, if I may. So I want you to think about the success that I have outlined. But can I ask if you think that higher education is, has been a platform for social mobility and for economic renewal. What do you think? Has it been a success in that regard? Okay, so two thirds think it has been a success. Universities are more diverse than ever. Uh, more graduates are employed than ever. So perhaps you're right. But something is amiss here. Um, there has been a collapse, particularly in the UK, of part-time students. And with it, the diversity of students has been lost. If we take the grand claims of past and present governments, of diversity of students. If you take out part-time students, actually higher education is less diverse now than it was 10 years ago. So we have to be careful about the information that uh, we take into account. There are fewer older people, minorities are less represented and that correlates in some ways to the collapse in part-time higher education. Okay, let's um, pause for my ramblings about whether or not we think higher education has been successful. And let's, let's think about the reality of where we are now. So what, what is a pandemic? Um, we can think about it purely as a, a, a viral contagion, but actually it's a series of nested crises, a series of problems that are stacked. So it might be a health crisis, but clearly it's going to be an economic crisis, a mental health crisis, a crisis of social mobility, of disruption on all levels. So pandemics are complex and health is one element only. And it's gonna be interesting to see the impact on every aspect of society. 
the early signs and the, the you know the British media is, 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 is always very happy to um, scream and shout about higher education how good it is how bad it is but the headlines have been interesting this has been almost a perfect storm for higher education it has prevented universities recruiting it looks like it will prevent the cash flow into universities for research and teaching. The primacy of the degree as this vehicle for being employed to earn a good salary is being challenged uh, with students being, their employability being affected. And of course, it will hit the heart of the business model of universities in terms of uh, the number of employees redundancies. So quite a dramatic beginning to a pandemic. Um, if you look at history, with the exception of the 2003 SARS uh, outbreak, pandemics tend to be a two or a three year issue. So we're right at the start of this. It's gonna be very interesting to see how this successful model of higher education You've told me you think it's successful in terms of its impact, effect. Um, what happens next? It's gonna be fascinating to see. So I'm, I'm gonna put an argument to, to you uh, and you may disagree uh, with me. But I think this recipe for success that I showed you could actually rapidly be a formula for disaster. So three-year degree, it's time-consuming, it's inflexible, it's expensive, it's bundled. By bundled, I mean you have to do what the university tells you. They select what those, those courses are in the main, and you study them. The campus-based model is limited by geography. If I can't get there, it's a problem. They're built for social togetherness, not social distancing. And sometimes the investments in bricks and mortar has actually meant that the investment in technology enabled learning has been more limited. The full time mode prevents learning and earning, often at the same time, that will have an impact on affordability. As we look towards this global recession, the post pandemic recession, a youthful university, how does that help those of us in our 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s? And it's often been funded by international tuition fees. And that revenue source is likely to be affected. So is, has, is the recipe for success sustainable? going forward. So I, I, I don't have a, um, uh, well, we, perhaps we could do, do a poll. Um, you know, uh, do, do we think um, that universities are essentially going to survive and thrive through not changing and keeping that recipe of success? Or do we think that it actually is the beginning of a significant change in higher education. So um, I, let, let's, do, let's do a poll just on the question of, essentially, do you think that universities will, won't change? So if you uh, think they won't change, say yes. If you think they will have to significantly change, please select no. So all it matters is, is that you, as a listener, have a view on this. Is this going to be Schumpeterian creative destruction or will more of the same get us to the future? So let's keep that in mind. So I, I, I just want to talk to you about the origins of extramural education, continuing education, non-traditional education. The origins weren't in a pandemic, but they were in around the need for rapid societal change. Um, higher education in the 1860s was inaccessible. It was exclusive. It was bound within the walls of 
Cambridge University, Oxford University, Aberdeen, Durham, and a few others besides. It was absolutely unaffordable. So lots of the drivers that the pandemic in 2020 will create, we think, were there in the 1860s. And what happened in Cambridge? So Cambridge was the first university in the world to actually practically deliver extramural education. And someone called Professor James Stewart is often um, given credit for being that pragmatic deliverer of continuing extramural education. He was a liberal, he was uh, incredibly intelligent, a mathematician, a uh, proto-engineer types. But it was actually really all about Anne Clough and Joseph E. Butler. Two early suffragists, two social reformers, two people who were um, compelled to protest against Cambridge and Oxford to ask why women were not included in higher education, to ask why the working classes were not included. And they lobbied and they fought. And Cambridge was very resistant. But James Stewart was the person who said, well, let's take this forward. This was in 1867. Let's deliver some extramural teaching in the northwest of England. Uh, let's see how that goes. They were expecting 30 or 40 uh, female teachers. And what they got were three or four or 500 uh, people attending. Of course, this was very anti-establishment. It was very controversial. Why should women, why should others other than the elite get higher education? And of course, there was a political motive. This was about societal change. This was about the vote, the vote for all. And if everybody was educated, then what was preventing the vote for everyone? So this isn't continuing education as we might imagine it today, perhaps a quieter, um, passive form of education. It was actually about access, inclusion. Uh, it was about democracy and rights. And I think it will be an important part of the same agenda going forward. Access to higher education is going to be key following the pandemic. It always has been, but more so now than ever. So extramural, um, quite an interesting concept. A break away from having to be on the campus, having to be registered, having to study at a time when the university says you, has, you have to study. Studying at a time that's more convenient for the student. So it's an important term, perhaps an overly British term, but extramural, extension, continuing, non-traditional. All of these synonyms are so important for reimagining higher education away from a formulaic, exclusive, campus-bound, full-time mode to something far more inclusive. And it was delivered by controversial, radical, um, different personalities. Forster, Priestley, Mallory, all tutors, all extramural tutors, Cambridge. This wasn't about forcing the agenda. This was about making people think in different ways. Again, in the Cambridge tradition, it is never ever about agreeing with a tutor or an expert. It is about a so-called expert putting arguments forward and for that to be challenged and broken down. And that's so important, I think. We are going to have to be more creative, more disruptive when we focus on the, the post-pandemic recovery. So delivery is important. And let, let's just talk briefly about the characteristics 
of extramural higher education. There's so much talk today about being student centered. In my view, continuing ed education always has been. It's focused on need. It's focused on social mobility at its core. The learning can be pure, but it also can be vocational and applied, often with radical curriculum. The most important thing is it addresses students as whole people. So what it asks is for peers, so students, to learn from one another. The academic is more a facilitator, someone who asks questions, who challenges, um, but it is peers who give their experience of whether or not they think the, the academic is right or wrong, whether the learning is of value. There's something very civic about it. It's about being relevant to communities, to towns, cities, regions, and addressing problems. As for example, in North America, extension learning focused initially on agriculture and building communities building those towns and cities. So it's a collective. It's accessible. It is not behind the walls of a university. It is in church halls, village halls, um, uh, civic centres, uh, schools. It is about bringing higher education into people's lives, not requiring you uh, to go to a university. I mean, one of the things we worry about a lot at Cambridge is this thing called imposter syndrome. In terms of our, our buildings are very grand, uh, our settings are grand. Um, and and, and that, that affects students. But it's not the student's problem, it's our problem to make the student feel included. Um, and actually to deliver closer to communities lessens the, the risk of imposter syndrome and it's it's delivered at sensible times in afternoons evenings summer schools weekends times that suit the learner it's cheaper more affordable because often it's a combination of the learner their employer and the taxpayer paying and it's unbundled we don't say that you have to study three years and all of these courses. It is just in time, it's flexible. It's what you need to learn to get a job, to, to be promoted, to learn about being a school governor, um, to, to, to change your career, uh, whatever it may be. So it's about your reasons for learning, not the university imposing those reasons. It's been a global, phenomenon. Um, the Open University, 50 years ago, probably the most important aspect of higher education in the UK in terms of inclusion. The University of London as a global uh, provider of non-standard education. I always enjoy reading about the history of the University of California. When it was designed, extension was designed to be the balance. So, for example, universities like Berkeley being highly selective, but their continuing education departments being open to anyone. The same with Harvard. And now new providers like edX, um, Udacity, Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, there are many different models, different interpretations of extramural extension, continuing education. But in the UK, it, it's been a bit of a different journey. Um, the Open University, many other universities have been challenged by the unintended consequence of this grand ambition for 50% of people to go into university. The policies, the funding meant that full-time campus-based education was prioritised over um, extramural modes. So that's both been a brilliant thing in terms of higher education being impactful. You told me that higher education earlier has been successful 
as an engine of social mobility and economic regeneration. But having to go to a campus, having to study full time, having to study at the university's convenience has essentially shut out large audiences of people. And it typically is the most disadvantaged people who've been shut out from higher education. So I think we should challenge our views on whether the last two decades has been successful or not. So a pandemic, an unintended consequence of a pandemic might actually be the creative destruction of higher education as we know it today. And it's not about a deliberate destruction. It might not happen. But if we are to search for more accessible, affordable, flexible, bundled, impactful types of higher education, my argument to you, and you may disagree, but is that a number of the answers are already there. They're 150 years old in terms of their principles, but they're as relevant now, probably more relevant than ever. So what are we doing at the University of Cambridge Institute of Continuing Education to reflect this? So we've decided for next year as a pilot, all of our undergraduates, certificates, diplomas, advanced diplomas, they're gonna be fully online, fully remote for the whole of the academic year, irrespective of what happens um, with the pandemic. Because we're, we're about access. And what we've been thinking about is, well, how would the 1.5 million people in the UK who have high risk to coronavirus, how will they continue their education? What about students who are healthy themselves, but live with vulnerable people? What about students who are dependent on public transport? What about international students who will have to have 14 days quarantine before they can study? So our role in Cambridge is to be the accessible, inclusive element. So we think we can do that most cost effectively. Uh, we think we can do that flexibly. We think we can think about things like time zones. Uh, we think we can think about key workers who are so busy that um, they need to have flexibility in the way that we deliver. And actually we think um, we, meet, we will meet our continuing education aims through fully remote delivery. Of course, the challenge will be to make sure that we build cohesive peer groups, communities of learners who speak to one another. And we've been doing a lot of thinking, talking about that. And I believe we can do that. Um, so for the first time ever in 800 years, there will be Cambridge University awards qualifications that do not require you to be resident in Cambridge. And I believe, or the argument I am presenting, is that that makes us more accessible and, and more inclusive. So it's time to, to wrap up on this beautiful afternoon. Um, I hope that I have given an optimistic view that higher education can be affordable, can be accessible, and that we have a recipe, an extramural education recipe that will allow us to do that. That we might have to challenge our views. We might have to forget what this rather formulaic, campus-based, expensive mode of higher education has been certainly for the last 20 years in England. And the entrepreneurial spirit, spirit of access, spirit of inclusion, the spirit of democracy, um, that extramural education has always had. I would propose that it is vital now to make sure that we do not leave people behind as uh, this global recession hits. We need to bring everyone with us to reskill, to upskill, to educate, to train, and we need to think about effective mechanisms. So 
I would argue perhaps that we do need to return to our roots. So the one thing, and uh, as always, I'm very nervous about this, um, and you can be as cruel or as kind as you wish to be. The one thing I said that I would like to have done in the last half an hour or so is at least to make you think about your future in higher education and to make informed and thoughtful decisions about life-wide learning. So the one thing I'm going to finish on, and I, I, I will disappear in technological splendor if the result is awful, um, but can you tell me yes or no whether, whether you think in some way um, I've achieved my aim? Uh, feedback in all of its forms is always valued, so thank you. I'll take that result. Um, thank, thank you very much. Uh, um, I'd just like to say thank you for your time. Um, some, a colleague of ours described um, these um, unending Zoom uh, meetings as the, the Zoombie apocalypse. Uh, so I do, I do realise it's not easy to um, consume information, so thank you. Um, I'd urge you to, to think about the University of Cambridge Institute of Continuing Education for your lifelong learning needs, um, to think about the needs of your colleagues and neighbours, uh, and to make sure that your community is learning. Um, the one thing we know about pandemics is they, they do influence societal change rapidly. Um, so we need to make sure that as many of our stakeholders are engaged with learning as possible. Mm -hmm.